Russ Janicki and I'm a student at the California Maritime Academy. Today I'm going to demonstrate dissolved oxygen analysis by the Winkler titration method. Titration is a common laboratory method of quantitative chemical analysis that is used to determine the unknown concentration of a substance. Winkler titration is a specific method invented in 1888 by Ludwig Winkler for determining the dissolved oxygen content in water. Dissolved oxygen is in the form O2 like we breathe from the atmosphere and is independent from the oxygen part of H2O. The dissolved oxygen content in water is important because fish and other aquatic animals like crabs and oysters require oxygen to survive. The oxygen content in water is a major factor for determining the type and abundance of organisms that can live there. Oxygen enters the water by two methods diffusion from atmosphere and photosynthesis by phytoplankton and aquatic vegetation. Three factors that influence DO in the water are temperature, atmospheric pressure, and salinity. The colder the water, the more oxygen it can hold, and the saltier the water, the less oxygen it can hold. DO is reduced in the water when decomposers like bacteria consume oxygen at a rate faster than the input of oxygen from the atmosphere and photosynthesis. The first step to measuring dissolved oxygen with the Winkler titration method is to properly collect the sample to be tested. For our sample collection, we went out on San Francisco State's research vessel questuary. The RV questuary is equipped with high-tech instrumentation for measuring different parameters in the bay. For our sample collection, we used the questuary CTD. A CTD is a piece of equipment which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. The CTD also has an electromechanical sensor that measures dissolved oxygen. The oxygen sensor's accuracy drifts with time, so it requires periodic calibration. The calibrations are based off comparing the sensor's results with results measured by the Winkler method. The CTD also has a ring of Niskin bottles around the perimeter called a rosette. These bottles have mechanically actuated caps on the top and bottom ends, so they can be lowered to a specific depth and shut. When the CTD is brought back to the surface, it holds samples of water from each of the selected depths in the Niskin bottles. The next step in the process is to extract some of the water from the Niskin bottles and fix it. When extracting the sample, we want to minimize any contamination by atmospheric oxygen, so fill from the bottom of the Winkler bottle and avoid bubbles. Let the Winkler bottle overflow enough time for three full volumes of the bottle to flush out. Next, we fix the sample by adding one milliliter of manganese chloride and one milliliter of alkaline iodine. Plug the bottle without trapping any bubbles and shake vigorously, then allow to sit for at least 30 minutes. The sample is now fixed and stable to be brought back to the lab for the rest of the process. Fixing the sample is important because without fixing, phytoplankton, bacteria, and other organisms in the water can quickly change the oxygen content through photosynthesis and respiration. Here is an example of the fixing process done in the lab so the reaction can be seen more clearly. Now that the sample is fixed and has sat at least 30 minutes, we are ready to titrate. Shake the bottle well so the precipitate mixes into the sample. Add one milliliter of Winkler 3 to your sample and stir well. If the precipitant does not fully dissolve, add another milliliter of Winkler 3. Now titrate the sample with sodium thiosulfate until the solution becomes a faint yellow. During the fixing process, reagents react with the dissolved oxygen in the sample to form manganic hydroxide, then iodine. The iodine in the sample is directly equivalent to the amount of dissolved oxygen, and we are actually titrating for the iodine rather than oxygen. Add a half a milliliter of starch to change the sample to a dark blue. This will allow the endpoint of titration to be seen easier. Continue to carefully titrate until the sample goes clear. When the sample is completely clear, we have reached the end point of our chemical reaction. Record the volume of sodium thiosulfate used on your data sheet. Now, with the volume of titrant and the volume of the sample known, the dissolved oxygen concentration of the sample can be found. A famous application of Winkler titration is the light bottle dark bottle experiment. This experiment was first performed in 1927 by Gardner and Grand. In this experiment, biologically active water is sealed in a light bottle and also in a dark bottle. In the light bottle, the sun can reach the water, so both respiration and photosynthesis take place. In the dark bottle, no sunlight reaches the water, so only respiration takes place. 
by measuring the dissolved oxygen concentration of each bottle, the oxygen produced by photosynthesis can be determined. To see some real-life dissolved oxygen applications, I made a trip to the U.S. Geological Survey's Menlo Park Lab and spoke with some scientists who have been working on the water quality of the San Francisco Bay Project. I'm Charles Martin. I work for U.S. Geological Survey and I'm a biologist. Um, our group studies water quality in San Francisco Bay and it's a long-term uh, research program that's been collecting samples uh, in San Francisco Bay for the last 40 plus years. Hi, I'm Tara Schrega. I work here at the U.S. Geological Survey. Charles and Tara gave me a tour of their lab and demonstrated a Winkler titration start to finish. The method they use for testing the San Francisco Bay water is just like the method practiced in the Cal Maritime Chemistry Lab, except for one extra piece of equipment. At the USGS lab, they have an automatic titrator. This machine precisely dispenses the titrant while measuring the sample's electrical conductivity. When the end point of the chemical reaction is reached, the electrical conductivity changes and the machine measures the amount of titrant dispensed. It then automatically calculates the sample's dissolved oxygen content. This machine removes some of the possibilities for human error in the process, making the results more precise and repeatable. I asked the scientists about the long-term DO trends in the Bay and how their research and environmental policy has affected it. So over almost 50 years of data, we've seen a number of interesting trends. For example, um, before the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, we were regularly detecting low oxygen in mostly the South San Francisco Bay. And then after the Clean Water Act, so wastewater treatment improved and less organics were coming into the system, um, since then we have not been detecting uh, extremely low dissolved oxygen, anoxia, hypoxia, stops happening uh, literally in response to the Clean Water Act. When the Clean Water Act was passed, we saw increases on regulation for pollution and effluent into the bay um, and a reduction in nutrient inputs into the bay, which are two of the main causes for low DO in a, in a bay like ours or an estuary. Um, so after 1972, the long-term time series that we've collected showed that DO is almost always above um, the state-mandated 5 milligrams per liter. It, we do sometimes see it dip below, but they're typically short-term events. Um, so it's a success story for San Francisco Bay.